Welcome back to Inside City Hall. As we've been telling you all week, the race between Congressman Michael Grimm and challenger Dominic Recchia is heating up. Our exclusive New York One poll shows the candidates separated by just a few points. And we also found out that Recchia wasn't exactly ready for prime time when it came to discussing a controversial proposed trade agreement. Meanwhile, over to the race for governor. It's getting very active with rivals Andrew Cuomo and Rob Astorino actually encountering each other upstate earlier today. We've got four top reporters here to help us discuss these stories and much more. Joining us are Bridget Bergen from WNYC Radio, Jacob Kornblow from the website Jewish Political Updates, Mara Gay from the Wall Street Journal, and Ozzie Pabra from Capital New York. Welcome to all of you and a special welcome to Jacob who is making his maiden appearance here on Reporters Roundtable. So welcome to you. Pleasure. I'm going to put you on the spot first. This seems weird with Cuomo actually campaigning because all of us covered the primary uh, against Zephyr Teachout, and he made a very deliberate point of saying that he was governing and he wasn't on the campaign trail and got a little bit of flack for it. So what's the strategy? I think he learned his mistake of giving your opponent uh, more media time and uh, garnering more votes, and therefore I think uh, it works for his advantage with $25 million in his uh, um, campaign chest and raising more money uh, while um, hitting his opponent with negative ads and ex um, um, directly engaging with his opponent. I think it rather works to his advantage, um, contrary to the primary. Right. Mara, and I should say that only a few minutes ago we learned that the governor has increased it to nearly 26 million bucks. Um, so he's got a, a pretty good war chest there. What's the strategy when it comes to these campaign commercials? And tell us about how it took kind of this odd turn with Astorino firing back uh, with a, a dead unicorn. Sure. Uh, my colleague Eric Orden did a, a, you know, a great story this week kind of about the Humpty Dumpty versus unicorn ads. The point is the ads, uh, without boring the viewers, have gotten a little bit silly. And I think what this really is, Jacob is exactly right. I think the governor, even though he's expected to win overwhelmingly, realizes that he still needs to control his own narrative. And that's whether he has aspirations of 2016 or not. If you don't define your story politically, somebody else is going to. And there right. was, go ahead. Oh, and, and remember, and this is the opponent that, that Cuomo wants. Remember, in the primary, he had a challenge from the left. He's always had a problem on the left. And this is something that he felt if he ignored it, it would somehow go away, or at least he wouldn't give it oxygen. He's, uh, the Cuomo's campaign seems to want to engage Astorino. They refer to him as an extremist, which would make Cuomo much more appealing and a moderate. You can actually call yourself a, a progressive if you're Andrew Cuomo, if you make Astorino a person who is against abortion rights, has an uh, issue with, with housing um, in his county, with ongoing federal lawsuit over there. This is the person that Andrew Cuomo sort of wants to campaign against. Yeah, Bridget, let me ask you also, there was a, a press conference today in which you talked about a very serious issue, which is counterterrorism, um, the th threat posed by the group that calls itself the Islamic State. So he was flanked by Democratic and Republican lawmakers. And then afterwards, we got a statement from the Astorino campaign that said that everything that the governor does at this time should be looked upon with certain, I think it's fair to say, suspicion because it is a political season. What kind of a strategy is that? I think from Cuomo's perspective, you appear very gubernatorial and you are a leader when you're talking about what you can do to protect New Yorkers. And you know, it's a version of what we saw him do earlier this week when he appeared with Governor Christie and Homeland Security Secretary and Mayor de Blasio talking about it specific to New York City. Um, he looks like the leader. I think it's a risky strategy on Astorino's part to question that because while there may be some validity to it, the people's safety is something that they take very seriously. Mm. And it's something, It's I don't think anyone would question that there are some security threats that need to be taken care of. Jacob? And I also think, uh, think that um, when it comes to national security, there has to be a bipartisan uh, um, measure. And uh, by, you know, you can attack the governor on everything. You're his opponent, you're his challenger, and you have uh, from now on till election day enough TV time to attack the governor. But to attack the governor when it comes to national security, I think it's a concern for all New Yorkers. And we just come now from the 13th anniversary anniversary of 9-11. And you know, I think it's a, it's a very delicate issue and it should be bipartisan um, support. Do you think this is measures. going to, to 
that Astorino is going to pay a political price for bringing this up. It's very dangerous, and a, an attack like this can go very wrong. All you need is one incident, one arrest, or even one alert mm -hmm. that reminds people of what kind of dangerous situation we're, we're in. The New York City uh, Police Department announced that the spike in hate crimes against Jews and Muslims was in part a result of the intense media coverage coming out of the Gaza Strip and ISIS and, and what was happening. People are being driven by, quote unquote, the emotions of that conflict and are reacting and it's having an impact on New Yorkers. And when an elected official like the mayor or the governor take a step to respond to it, to have a challenger say that that's political, well, you, you're, you're raising a very charged issue and the person who arguably looks worse in that is the person making the, the accusation. And Cuomo himself was accused of doing something similar to this back in 2002 when he said basically that Pataki was holding uh, Giuliani's coat um, after the September 11th attacks. Anyway, this is a story I'm sure that's going to go on. So let's switch gears to the Recchia Grim fight. Grim, according to our, whole, our poll, narrowly head, but, but kind of not, should not be comfortable with having the numbers that he has considering that he is an incumbent. On the other side, Recchia probably, as I said, did, did himself no favors when he talked to our Courtney Gross earlier this week. She asked him a completely legitimate question uh, about his opposition to a trade agreement. Let's take a listen to what the uh, Democratic hopeful said. Made in America. That's what we're all about. What exactly is the TPP? Okay. Sorry, we're going to head back inside back. Okay. because we're waiting. What exactly is the TPP? Okay. Oi. <laughs> Mara, go ahead. Uh, right. So I think number one here, just pulling back a little bit, the poll this week showed that there's an opening uh, for sure for Dominic Recchia here. Uh, he needs to prove to these voters that he's ready to take on this role. Um, essentially, uh, you know, the more people get to know him, the more they like him. But, uh, you know, his challenge, I, I'm sorry, the incumbent, uh, basically Michael Grimm's entire argument is that Dominic Recchia isn't ready for prime time and he's not helping. So. Right. Ozzy? Yeah. It, well, Grimm is under indictment. He has a, a case that, that he's arguing that, that the um, tax evasion cause was, was a po political hit. But he, as Bob Hart, who's the political director here, had, had sort of noted, he's at an anemic level already. But, but what, what Dominic Recchia is getting, according to the poll, is the baseline of what any Democrat will get. If you have the incumbent below 50 percent, that's an opening for the challenger. But when the, chal the, the, the reason why the Courtney Gross exchange with, with the congressman is so vital is that it speaks to the, the idea that he is not ready to take on the role of a congressman. And, and as we're seeing with, with issues like uh, national security, we want people in office that sort of know what they're doing. Yeah, Bridget, do you think that it matters to voters um, out in Staten Island? Is it important to them? You know, the voters that I've talked to certainly talk about security as being one of their top concerns. Um, you know, I was talking to a very specific group of voters last night, Grimm supporters, um, but they talk about the fact that they feel like he understands these security issues in a way that his Democratic opponent, opponent can't. The fact that Dominic Recchia also comes from Brooklyn in this particular district is also another challenge that he faces, and that's a gap that he will have to close. He may have more support in that part of the district, but he has less support in the Staten Island part of the district, which is where the majority of the voters are. Do we think, Jacob, that, he is, that Recchia is going to do something more substantive? that he'll actually say that I am prepared to be a congressman as opposed to saying I'm not Michael Graham, I'm not under indictment, I'm not threatening to throw reporters off the balcony in the Capitol Rotunda? It's all about perception. When you are lagging in the polls, you really need to edge ahead and uh, he cannot afford um, stumbling even once. So if he wants to uh, go a prime time and go head to head with Grimm, who's a good campaigner, uh, he needs to show that he's up for the fight and not stumble or have any gaff in his pocket. Okay, we're gonna have to leave it there, but we'll have more with our reporters roundtable when we return. And then later, I'll tell you what you can expect to see on Monday night's program. Don't go away. Welcome back to Inside City Hall. We're back talking about the weekend news with four members of our Reporters Roundtable, Bridget Bergen from WNYC Radio, Jacob Kornbluff from the website Jewish Political Updates, Mara Gay from the Wall Street Journal, and Ozzy Pabra from Capital New York. And we'll stick with you, Ozzy, and talk about something that was in your website this week, an article about the banning or the attempt to ban horse carriages from Central Park. Let's read a quote from an anonymous council member talking 
The council feels that we are being forced to pay off one of de Blasio's debts by being forced to even consider this, said another council member who is officially undecided on the issue. This is not something that is at the top of our agenda. It's at the top of his agenda. What kinds of debts is the councilman talking about there? Uh, one of the advocacy groups that came out early in support of Bill de Blasio was NICLAS, and they have been trying to get uh, horse-drawn carriages banned from New York City streets. And they are a dedicated group. They're very uh, vocal, organized, and energized. And when Bill de Blasio was in fourth place, he embraced their issue, and they in turn embraced him and provided him crucial support, namely when they helped attack Christine Quinn, who is the front runner. What is significant about this, even if you don't care about horses and what happened in and around that industry, is the idea that you're seeing, for, the, for one of the first time, some daylight in between the city council, which is supposed to be an independent check on the mayor's power, and this new mayor who came in with historic uh, support after the general election. Uh, the mayor helped install the speaker of the city council, and the impression that the council is acting in accordance with the mayor's general wishes is a narrative that's been hard to get around and w for the first time, you're actually seeing some people grumble about the fact that they're having to follow his agenda rather than set their own. Right. And that, that other agenda, the horses are supported by a number of powerful labor unions, right, Mara? Yes, the Teamsters, actually, who ironically, in a sense, actually endorsed Mayor de Blasio when he ran for election last year, are also representing the carriage drivers. There are about 150 carriage drivers. Um, and so you've got this strange amalgamation of, of you know, kind of influences, but, but I would agree with Ozzy. I think he's exactly right. I think this is a moment where you're seeing the mayor, uh, you know, being tested on his campaign promises. And he said he was going to get this done in week one. It's been nine months. And this is, you know, among council members, when you talk to them and, and talk to their staffs, this is kind of the issue that shall not be named. Nobody wants to talk about horse carriages. Uh, they would rather kind of keep going and ignore it and shuffle it under the rug. Interesting. Well, let's talk about what you guys are going to be doing next week. I imagine that we'll be somewhat talking about horse carriages, although you're working on other stories as well. Bridget, you're talking about what's happening on Staten Island and a little bit of Brooklyn. We're going to look a little bit more at what's going on with Congressman Grimm and Dominic Recchia. They have a head-to-head -head forum on Tuesday night, so we'll see if they brush up on their uh, talking points and if they can take questions about these issues that are going to matter to their district. Okay. Jacob? I'm going to talk about the race for governor. Um, it's uh, the new year, Rosh Hashanah. We're going to have a lot of uh, statements about the importance of the Jewish year and Israel and so on. So um, I'm going to actually look on how uh, Governor Cuomo and Rob Estorino fare among Jewish voters and how their outreach is going to go ahead over the next few weeks. Okay. Mara? Sure, I'm going to be taking a look at Staten Island as well. You know, this is supposed to be the number one seat for uh, Democrats to pick up. And so I'm just going to be taking a look and seeing how they're doing. Okay, and Ozzy. The NYPD has addressed in a very unique way the challenge that is happening over in the Middle East. And, and they're saying that uh, the conflict with ISIS, what's happening in the Gaza Strip, is having an impact here in New York. And specifically, what Police Commissioner Bratton has said is that previously, the NYPD had been had looked out for people that were making contact with organized terrorist groups, uh, going overseas, getting trained, and coming back. And now they're seeing, especially with ISIS, is a sophisticated group that is inspiring people with uh, Twitter and videos and even a magazine. And the idea that the NYPD is now having to play defense against suspected terrorists who aren't even traveling overseas but searching online is creating a, a new challenge for a police department that is already at the forefront of one of the most challenging problems in law enforcement. Okay, looking forward to reading about that. All right, finally, fall is upon us almost. The fall classic has happened sort of a couple of days ago when uh, Mayor de Blasio there uh, in Brooklyn took the field and played the city council. But Ozzy, you don't want it to end here. It's, it's, it's not ending uh, at, uh, no. there he is, there's the mayor. No, a after seeing him play, um, Oi, that's where he pulls, him, pulls something? He, he quote-unquote pulled <laughs> something. Uh, he wouldn't exactly elaborate. But there were, there were reporters who saw the mayor's performance and said, you know what, we'd also like a chance to, to take a swing at, at your pitches. And uh, the mayor had accepted a challenge to play softball against reporters. There are any number of times where the uh, press that uh, meets and uh, <laughs> spends time outside of work 
with the flags that represent city agencies. And this is just another opportunity for people that work together a lot to, to sort of break the ice, get to know each other. And hopefully if it's done for charity or at least for a good laugh, people can see that the reporters that work on their behalf and the city government that usually works on their behalf can actually get something done even when there are some acrimonious moments between the two. Better okay. than Congress. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, great. We shall see how that goes. All right, we'll be warming up next time as well. Time now for a quick break. I'll be back with a preview of Monday night's program. Don't go away.